Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is my good friend and uh, naturalist, Hobie Hare. And we are here at Dunrovin on the first day of spring, although actually wasn't the first day of spring yesterday, this it year? It was technically, but today is a beach day. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, all of us in western Montana are lapping up these warm temperatures. Uh, it's hard to believe it's spring. We are sitting in a, a snowdrift uh, still uh, at this late time in March. Uh, who would know that it was spring at all? But indeed... Um, you can feel the sun today, can't you? You really can. And we've got a couple of bare spots of grass right over here, right in front of us. And yes. then to Suzanne's left, yeah. your right. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're going to see probably in about a month once all the snow finally melts. Yes, exactly. And for those of you who are uh, new to Days at Dunrovin, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Hobie's uh, background a little bit. So Hobie, tell us a little bit about some of your naturalist activities. You've been engaged in... Uh, connecting people with nature for a very long time, have you not? I have, pretty much all my life, but um, it all started when I was teaching at Montana State University. I was teaching uh, international students how to safely enjoy being in the Northern Rockies without getting in trouble with the bison in Yellowstone or the bear somewhere else. And right. I was a park ranger for a number of years and a guide uh, with the Yellowstone Institute and uh, left the teaching field, but didn't really truly leave it all behind because that's part of my life's work, helping people connect with nature. And I do that through tours of national parks, uh, events like working with you, uh, meditations, uh, apps, and lots of photography too. Yeah, what an interesting um, pursuit you have made in your life. Thank it's you. A, it's a, a kind of a you're kind of a freelance naturalist who has found a number of different channels for for outlets. Isn't that is, would that be right? Yeah, exactly. And that way, it just kind of keeps me busy and interested and motivated because there's always something new to do. And I'm kind of a Renaissance person. I love just learning about nature and sharing it with other people. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah. So, um, so have what signs of spring have you been noticing, uh, Hobie? Well, lots of woodpeckers are out and about now. Um, Rebbing blackbirds are back. Uh, in force. In force. Yeah, I mean, we had a few. You know, we, we put a bench uh, bird feeder up this year right on where the uh, fields break over to the riparian. So it's an edge. Mm -hmm. And those are always uh, happy spots for animals. Right. You know, they have the cover and they can sneak out and get the resources. And we had a few uh, red-winged blackbirds who stayed all winter, but, boy, the last couple of weeks they've just taken over and you can hear them constantly they have a very uh unique trill and they seem pretty happy and they're getting more territorial yes. and i guess they're probably trying to figure out the mates and who's got the nesting territories here and there and we've been hearing sandhill cranes quite a bit we've heard them too on our web cameras haven't seen them yet yeah uh, yeah but i've heard them yeah what about the osprey any uh confirmed no sightings? signs of the osprey but just on tuesday we took our bird feeders down from the osprey's nest wonderful and if you look at the osprey's nest you'll see what looks like a bird up there that's uh mother goose and right. mother goose decoy is up there to keep the real mother goose from trying to steal the nest good and, of course, we've been hearing the geese fly uh, through, including uh, snow geese. Have you been seeing snow geese? Yes, especially uh, last Sunday, Monday, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, almost every day. They seem to be just flying over the Missoula Valley and the Bitterroot Valley. And it seems like they're flying in groups of about 500 to 1,000. They're just yeah. massive. Yeah, I'm hopeful that they would land. One, one year we did have them land in, in our winter field. It was quite a spectacle. Wow. It was great, yeah. It, which, this is the fun part about being in nature. You never know who's going to show up or what's going to happen. And uh, we have some other things happening in nature right now with some emergences, don't we? With, we do. Yeah. We do. We have the emergence of you know very tentative flowers in a couple of places, and we're starting to see pockets of green grass. We're starting to see... Um, things like nuthatches and um, chickadees kind of changing their feeding habits because there's more bugs out. Believe it or not, with all the snow on the ground, there's bugs out and birds like that are after that. So are the robins. Uh, I haven't seen any worms yet, but they're coming. I'm, I'm sure the robins have seen them. Yeah. And then uh, one of our most formidable and yet probably most understood uh, species of mammals that we share the, uh, the landscape with, the grizzly bear, uh, as well as the black bears, they're emerging out of hibernation now. Tell us about hibernation, uh, Hobie. What exactly, sure. uh, when does it start and, and, and physiologically what happens? Well, what happens with a lot of mammals such as ground squirrels and rodents, which are true hibernators, excuse me, hibernators, their body temperature can get down into the low to mid 30s, which is not much above the freezing temperature. 
And so these animals are very torporous, meaning they're hard to awaken. But even they could wake up, get out of their holes, go to the bathroom, look around, then go back. Um, bears, on the other hand, are not true hibernators because their body temperature is probably more in the 70s and 80s compared to a normal temperature, which is probably somewhere around ours. I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, bears uh, can be easily aroused. And I think probably what, your husband has a story about that from Alaska? Oh, Just, he has uh, a number of stories about <laughs> that. In, in fact, I, I will relay a little of that. They uh, tag bears in the wintertime mm -hmm. uh, in dens. Right. And uh, oftentimes when they tag a, a bear, they may put a radio collar on it, and mm -hmm. there's a special beep that the radio collar emits when it needs to be changed, when the battery's running low. Mm -hmm. And they know exactly where the bear is, so they go to um, the, the bear's den, and um, believe it or not, they crawl in. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> they, yes. they crawl in, and they they generally uh, do stick the mother. Uh, many of these are sows with cubs. Yeah. They do stick the mother with a a a, uh, a drug to an uh, What do you want to put 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 them to sleep a little bit, mm -hmm. and then crawl in there. But my I have some great photos of my husband holding bear cubs in snowbanks in, in Alaska from having dug into um, bear stands, but. They can wake up and they can, you know, they can be fully awake in a short period of time. Right, and what's really interesting about bears, even though they're not a true hibernator, they will basically shut down and be quiet and save the fat they've gained, usually beginning in November, December, and they'll burn through that pretty well over the course of the winter. But what's interesting is that they can be very motionless for most of the winter, and when they emerge, they don't have any osteoporosis, any significant degeneration uh -huh. of their bones or any vital organs. They just seem to be able to regulate themselves, save the energy, work off their fat, and then come winter, emerge like fit and ready to go. That's fascinating, and it seems like there might be some medical applications for knowing exactly how they do that. Yes, people are studying uh, bears for their ability to do that, and one application might be for people who are bedridden for a long period of time yeah. and get bed sores or just right. lose their muscle mass right. and their bone strength, how you could help people in those circumstances. Right. And then NASA is also looking at the same properties that bears are able to, not properties, but capacities for space journeys. Right. So let's say they put us on a spaceship and sent us to Mars and we couldn't move around much for a couple of years, we'd still be decently able to get around on Mars once we got there. One really wonders what the physiology of all that is. I mean, that's really fascinating. It's remarkable. Yeah, and so uh, our bears can teach us something, can't they? Well, there's so much we don't understand about the natural world um, and other species, and I think that's just another wonderful argument for protecting their habitat because um, we all, I think, can share this planet together, and there's, there's enough space for bears. And there was even one down near Stevensville uh, in November caught in a trap, and that was the first one documented in the Bitterroot Valley in a long time. So a grizzly bear, you mean? A grizzly bear, yeah. Yeah, on the golf course. Yeah. And he thought he was going to go golfing, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Not November. Yeah. So um, one of the implications of the bears reemerging is our bench bird feeder. And I know many of you have really been enjoying our uh, bench bird feeder because it has attracted so many animals. This has been a really difficult late winter. We've had some record low temperatures for March mm -hmm. and some record snowfalls here in Montana. So many of the animals are really stressed uh, right now as, a, as this should be bare ground normally and they're still looking for food. So our bird feeders, um, you know, the birds are a messy lot. They, I bet. <laughs> yeah, they just throw it all over the place. And the raccoons, I think we uh, had a record number of raccoons last night at the bench bird feeder. There were 10 of them uh, at one time. That's amazing. We've had uh, fox come by and coyotes come by. And, of course, uh, some of our, our late night viewers have caught the flying squirrels. That's fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. You know, I did not know we had flying squirrels. And about once we, I saw them here, I read up on them, and evidently the riparian area is exactly where you would find them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't even know we had them here on, uh, at Dunrovin. And then, of course, the deer have also been showing up every day. Mm -hmm. But the concern now is the bears will uh, show up. They're going to be coming out hungry. Mm -hmm. They've been uh, in hibernation since November? November, in some cases, yeah. Yeah. 
And so they're going to be looking for food. And so as soon as the ospreys return, which should be within the next couple of weeks, we are going to alter our bench uh, bird feeding station. And I happen to know that our tech guru mechanic guy, James Wassum, <laughs> and our other wonderful welder guy, uh, James Garland, who, whom we call G3 because there's two Jameses and we can't get them, oh, know, right. we get them confused. <laughs> are going to be working on completely modifying that bench bird feeding uh, station and uh, building a water feature. So uh, stay with us and watch that happen over the summer. Uh, we're going to try to design it not only for uh, winter bird feeding, but for summer bird feeding, which means we'll have to have very elevated uh, bird feeders that are uh, out of reach of the uh, bears and we'll also have to make sure that we don't let the birds scatter it all over the place. So there's going to be some modifications and um, I'm also interested in attracting our many hummingbirds mm -hmm. that we have in the summer. And they migrate, do they not, from Montana? They do. I'm not sure exactly where they all go, but I would imagine probably parts of Baja California, maybe southernmost Arizona, maybe the lower Rio Grande Valley and then farther south. And, yeah. and, um, and we have three species, I believe, in Montana. Mm -hmm. they're, they're beautiful. So we'll try to attract some of those. But that's on our list of things to do now that the bears have come out of hibernation. Yeah, and I wanted to share with everybody a, a poem that I really like, which really describes the first week of March. And then after that, if it's okay to share with you, the one that describes the way it's feeling right now. Okay, absolutely. So um, for anyone who is not in Montana, the first weekend and first week in March, we hit... 12 below and even colder in western Montana that yes. week. And here it is, about 57 degrees, so about 70 degrees warmer today. But this first poem uh, is by Charles Dickens, and he was writing about one of those early March days, I believe. It was one of those March days where the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it is the summer in the light and winter in the shade. Oh boy, that does sum it up, doesn't it? Yeah, because it was brutal. I mean, wow. it was hard to be outside for more than 10 minutes at a time. It was windy also, yeah. And now here we are, March 21st, about two and a half weeks later. This is by Jean Hersey. And she said, in March, winter is holding back and spring is pulling forward. Something holds and something pulls inside of us too. Boy, that's so true, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yep, something, something cold and something warm, always that pulling and pushing. Hobie, how do you help people um, stay connected to nature when they can't get outside? When, you know, I've had periods in my life where I've been ill and confined both to a hospital room or to my own room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I miss being out in nature. I miss feeling the warmth of the sun and the, mm -hmm. and the fresh air and hearing the birds and all of that. So what do you do to, uh, what, what do you tell people to do when they are, find themselves in those kinds of circumstances and, and want to experience the many benefits of nature? Sure. Um, I think one thing is just to have a photograph or a tangible object of nature by your bed stand or in your office, someplace mm -hmm. where it's easy to touch or to something, see. Something to hold. Uh huh. Uh, even your screensaver on your TV, or sorry, mm -hmm. your computer. Um, and then another thing, too, is just to station yourself by a window. Make sure you've got a window looking outside rather than you're just staring at a brick wall. Uh, they've shown, well, studies have shown that whether you're in a prison or whether you're healing from a major illness, if you're looking out at something in the natural world, you're going to heal and feel better much faster than you would if you're just staring at a barren wall or a brick wall or an industrial site. Yeah, I've been reading where even uh, what we provide here at, uh, at Days at Dunrovin with the na natural sounds and the natural vistas can produce some of the same benefits of being in nature, such as lowering people's blood pressure and, mm -hmm. and uh, influencing their emotional moods. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that we all understand uh, you know, the, the benefits we get and seek them out. So what else can people do? Well, um, I'd love to show everybody and lead people through a, a visualization. Mm. You can call it a meditation if you like, but the idea is just to connect with nature and use as many senses as you can. Mm -hmm. And um, all I want to say is that please don't be operating any heavy machinery or driving a car or an airplane right now while we do this because we want you to be present and not multitasking. But mm -hmm. um, we could just start, why don't we do this? Um, I'll just kind of lead people through a couple of 
exercises okay. to kind of relax. And right. um, when we do this, we should do this very carefully because there's so much snow. Yeah. But if, if you can, where you are, and if you cannot, that's fine. If you can, just kind of stand up for a second. All right. Hey, take a yawn. You know, force yourself to yawn. Oh. Stretch your arms. Maybe put them behind your back. Maybe lean forward a little bit. And then bring your arms in front and just kind of dangle them. And maybe after that, just kind of move your arms around like this if you can. About four times would be great. And just take your time and then do it in reverse. I feel like I'm sweating already. This is good. And then if you can, just raise your arms above your head. And maybe yawn one more time. And go ahead and sit back down if you're ready. And I'm going to do this very carefully because I think I've got two legs in one layer of snow and two legs in another. <laughs> okay, good. We landed successfully. Um, and so now what I'd like you to do is to um, close your eyes for just a minute and put your tongue behind the tip of your teeth, your top teeth. And just kind of push against it lightly. And open your eyes as you do that. And close your eyes as you do that. And notice any kind of sensations. And yawn again with your eyes closed. And your eyes open. And then just kind of sit back in your chair or your sofa, wherever you are, and maybe just kind of relax your feet and leg posture so nothing's tense. And put your hands on your lap or somewhere else where it's comfortable. And what I'd like you to do is to follow Suzanne and I on a journey that's going to take place right here at the ranch. And I'd like you, first of all, just to imagine that you're sitting in the chairs with us. You're not cold. There's no wind today. The sun feels great. And your feet are on the snow, but your feet are very warm. You're just enjoying all that warm, strong, direct sun that has been uh, vacationing away from Montana for several months. And just really feel the sun on your hat, if you're wearing one, on your hair on your scalp, on your face, on your shoulders, on your arms and chest, on your lower body. And if you can, if it feels comfortable, just drop your arms and relax them even more. And feel a very, very slight breeze. It's not cold, it's refreshing. Feel that same breeze blow across your face and your neck and your arms and your hands and all over you. And it's just a really nice sensation. After four months of wearing tons of clothing and biting wind and lots of snow and cold and short days, the sun and the breeze just feel wonderful. Let's take four deep breaths together, and after that, I'm going to ask you to imagine smelling different things that might be happening in springtime in Montana or wherever your feet might be. So let's just take four breaths together. I'd like you to notice how the sun, the warming sun and the breeze are just carrying smells around from maybe the horse corral or where the, the divas are hanging out today here. Imagine catching an occasional smell of the earth waking up again, the ground thawing, what the earth smells like again, the mulch that's coming up. Imagine walking over to one of the ponderosa pine trees here, or another conifer, and very carefully just standing close with the breeze and smelling it. And with ponderosa pine trees, sometimes they smell like vanilla. Smelling a pine tree of other kinds always reminds me of something like a, a Christmas tree uh, thing you put in your car, a deodorant thing. Uh, but maybe it just brings you back memories of the holidays. But notice all the smells as the earth is waking up again. We're going to take four breaths and then we're going to be quiet for a minute and I'd just like you to enjoy 
all the sounds that you can hear here at, Do at Dunrobin Ranch. So let's breathe four times together, then we'll be quiet for a minute. So let's take four breaths and then come back together and keep your eyes closed if you can. Imagine that as the sun shines through you and in you and reaches down to the ground and warms the earth again bringing back spring in the northern hemisphere. Imagine that same warming up earth, that awakening earth, awakening up in you, coming back through you, that new energy, that new energy of spring, of vitality, of promise and potential and possibilities and excitement. As we go through spring, create some time. Sit outside if you can. If not, imagine you're here at Dunrobin with Suzanne and I as spring unfolds from green grass to flowers to trees that leaf out and all the birds, and all the animals, and the wildlife, and the people that are very happy that spring is back once again in Big Sky Country. So what I'd like you to do now is just to open your eyes, and Suzanne and I are going to be quiet for about 30 seconds, and just kind of notice what's different. So we're going to be quiet for about 30 seconds, and then we'll touch base about a couple things. How you doing? I'm fine. Good. Your hands are warm. Isn't that nice? They are armed. Yes. That was very nice, Hobie. I enjoyed that uh, Me too. tremendously. Um, I could not help but think of my father. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I think the thoughts of my father came from that wonderful warm feeling of sun on my cheek. Mm -hmm. I could uh, notice the difference between my right cheek, which is in the shadow, mm -hmm. and my left cheek, which is just bathed in this beautiful sun. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a, a couple of thoughts. You know, my father um, died when he was in his mid-80s, and he had Alzheimer's. Mm. And um, I'm very uh, grateful to my family for always making the effort to bring him out to Dunrovan mm -hmm. and to enjoy nature. Good. And I remember that one of the last times that I saw him smile and be of the moment was um, sitting in the sun on one of these kind of same spring days where the, the sun is warm but not threatening in terms of a heat of summer. Right. Where you think you have to protect your cheek. Mm -hmm. You can just absorb it and bring it into your skin and just sort of open up your pores. Yeah. And my father did that. I could tell he, he couldn't quite articulate what mm -hmm. he was feeling, but I saw it in him, mm -hmm. even though he, he didn't speak it to me. Right. He would just sort of keep his, his cheek there, and, and he, got, he got very uh, wistful mm -hmm. and uh, of the moment. And I think 
maybe that's one of the things that nature does more for us than anything, mm -hmm. is to put us in the moment. Right, because um, really in nature there is no yesterday or tomorrow. I, I doubt a tree agonizes over what it did or didn't do yesterday or what it has to do tomorrow. I mean, it's yeah. the beauty of nature. I mean, a lot of processes are automatic and yeah, you might have to hunt and find something to eat, but uh, at the same time, you can't be so scattered that you're ineffective and inefficient right now. And I also wanted to uh, make some observations that I, um, I've been having such fun with our new river camera, so I, mm -hmm. I go and look for things. Mm -hmm. And yesterday on the beach were two deer sunbathing. Nice. You know? Mm -hmm. And you could tell that they were just lapping up the sun. Uh -huh. And across the river, sitting on an ice floe, which is just breaking up, were a bunch of geese doing exactly the same. Excellent. They were sitting on, on the uh, ice, just lapping up the sun that was directly on them. I mean, you could just tell the whole world mm -hmm. was sort of pausing to absorb this beautiful sunshine and mm -hmm. to welcome back, you know, say goodbye to the hard days and mm -hmm. say hello to some of the easier days for, for animals and birds. And, and so I, I thank you for this, um, you this quiet time, this you little respite, this little pause. And I, I do believe that these are the kinds of things that were we to practice on a, on a more regular basis, mm -hmm. we could then summon them when we are most in need. Right. And um, some people might take a, uh, a picture with them when they're traveling. So if they're delayed in an uh, airport terminal, they've got a picture or something they can relax with. It could be an illustration. It could be a tangible object. Uh, you name it. But it's just nice to keep something handy. Yeah. Because uh, not all of us are visual. Some people are more auditory. Uh, right. Some people are more tactile. Uh, take tactile. A, take something to hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To transport you from where you are to where you might want to be or to that that moment in nature that you know calms you and mm -hmm. uh, brings down your blood pressure all of those wonderful benefits of just thinking about and letting your mind take you there even if your feet cannot and you touched on something too i think it's important and um i think sometimes in our culture uh, just sitting around in the sunshine can be seen as unproductive or loafing, but it's just as important as working hard or yes. anything else. And yes. you think about these animals that have just navigated winter. And our cat yesterday was outside where the week before there was a foot of snow, and it was just totally asleep and bundled up in a bunch of leaves that were kind of rotting and decomposing. But that was her heaven. Yeah. And it's like it's, yeah. it's spring break for all of us. It <laughs> is. Yeah. Yeah. And when you mentioned uh, smells, that's the smell that came to me. That that organic mulch, the the li the life coming back to the soil. Yeah. And to the there's just an aroma there that's just so organic. Mm -hmm. And um, a yeah, beautiful hobby. Okay. I I very much uh, appreciate your having done that for us. Well, it's always nice to be here and to share with the community. And uh, it's just. One of many things that we can do to connect with nature, and it's an easy one. It's cheap. It's, <laughs> it is. It's, all you got to do is take 10 minutes. Take 10 minutes. So, Hobie, what have you got on your short-term schedule before we see you in June, on June 13th, I believe? I believe it is the 13th, yes. I'll be leading a tour uh, to the Grand Canyon of Arizona uh -huh. and to Zion National Park in April. And then my husband Eric and I, we're going to be in... Um, similar territory in late April, uh, celebrating 10 years, and uh -huh. we're gonna go down to Page and Lake Powell. We've uh -huh. never been to that part of the world. Uh -huh. And uh, got a trip in Yellowstone in June, I think right after we get together, but I'll be taking people to look for wildlife in Yellowstone and the Tetons, and I'm sure in the next couple of months there'll be plenty of wildlife running around this ranch and everywhere else in between too. Yeah. So those are the highlights coming up. So uh, take us along, if you can, on some of your, your excursions sure. into nature. Uh, we have a Connecting with Nature discussion board. Mm -hmm. And Hobie will check in once in a while between trips to yeah. see what's happening. And I would love to have you share your thoughts about what we did today. If you followed along, I would love to hear about that, as, as I'm sure Hobie would as well. So go to that discussion board. You just go to the Explore page and find the Connecting with Nature, and there the, you'll find the discussion board. And let us know um, your own natural connections and how you uh, interpreted what we did today and if it had meaning to, uh, for you. I'd really appreciate that. 
Um, well, this is great. Uh, we're going to see you back on the, the 13th of June right. to welcome summer. Absolutely. It's hard to believe that's just in about three months. And yeah. boy, are things going to look different compared to today. <laughs> <laughs> Very different. Well, um, thank you all for joining us on this uh, little mental meditation excursion and for enjoying the spring with us. And with that, maybe we can say happy, happy spring. spring. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.